play the technology game and figure out the presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share with you my experience of working in um, a region of the world that has shown incredible rapid development and how this really impacts on how we think about libraries and sustainability issues. Um, so I've been in Hong Kong for nearly seven years now. I previously worked in China in the early 80s. Hong Kong is a, a stunning, beautiful city. It's also highly, highly urbanized. And in fact, if you've been there, you can probably walk through Hong Kong on walkways for most of Hong Kong without touching the ground. Um, it, it's really a stunning, very different place to be. And it's also in a region, um, particularly around Greater China, where uh, nearly a billion people have lifted themselves out of poverty since the early 80s. And that is having an incredible impact on the environment. So this is, this is a kind of the wonderful tourist view of Hong Kong with the junk in the harbor, but you're wearing a mask because the pollution can actually be fairly bad. And this is what we faced last September. Uh, this is Typhoon um, Mankut. You can see you know, office buildings, windows uh, destroyed, lots of flooding. And in the, the, the typhoons seem to be increasing in um, intensity. Um, so we face as does the whole world, actually, many, many challenges. But I wanted to share with you about the, the actual pace and scale of development in, in Greater China. Um, this has been um, unbelievable when you see it, and it's not going to stop. It's going to continue. Um, there are plans for what we call the Greater Bay Area, which is um, Hong Kong, Macau, Guangdong province, actually rivaling um, San Francisco, New York, and the Tokyo Bay Area. It already does in terms of land area, population, um, growth, uh, air passenger transport, air cargo, container ports, uh, GDP is growing as well and there are plans to ramp this up. So the, the development is going to continue. Whatever you think about that, it's, go, it's going to happen. So what does that mean for us as librarians in this region? And this is a real challenge. Um, this, these are quotes from a study that was done by a, a Chinese librarian. Uh, interviewing directors of library services. And their conclusion was that the priority has been to attain economic and social development goals, rather than look at environmental sustainability. And you can see these, these quotes, you know, the libraries are relatively passive in respect to green issues, um, new library buildings and massive growth of facilities may have a negative impact on the environment, but it's less than manufacturing. Okay, so this, these kind of quotes, I think, are, are what's a real challenge, because our attitudes and our awareness of green issues and sustainability issues is fundamental to making any changes. 
Um, and my argument, and this is the, really the one takeaway from the talk today, is that librarians need to be fully aware of green issues and they need to take a leadership role in this area. Um, if you look at some of the literature on, on construction in, in China, there is a growing interest in green buildings that's developing rapidly, but it's still at a very low level. Um, there are issues about the higher cost of green buildings, and that really needs to be acknowledged. There are issues around um, a very conservative estimate of the longer term savings that are being made with green buildings in, in China compared with the rest of the world. So equipping yourself with that information about actually what are the real costs of green buildings and what are the longer term implications of green buildings are really important. But what the literature also says is that um, doing the right thing is a really strong driver uh, for green building in, in greater China. And also PR is a really strong uh, driver, very good publicity. So there are things that librarians need to be aware of and can use to push for green buildings. And I just wanted to very quickly share with you that there is a network out there um, that we can all tap into. Uh, the IFLA Environment, Sustainability and Library Special Interest Group, NSULIP. It's fantastic. It has a green library checklist that's multilingual, which I'll show you in a minute. It has an IFLA Green Library Annual Award. So as well as applying for the Public Library Award, you can also apply for the Green Library Award. Um, there are a whole number of publications. It's 2018, a new book came out. It has events at WLIC, and there is a discussion list. So please, if you're interested in this area, have a look and join NCLIB. It's um, really, really helpful. The checklist, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this green library checklist starts with project planning and finance and then goes through the whole of the design, build and operation so that a green li as a green library, you are really trying to minimize the impact on the environment. And it's a wonderful educational tool for librarians librarians and it's multilingual. You can get to it from the NSLIB website. Please use it. So what I just want to argue is that we have a duty to be exemplars in this area for our societies. And I just want to share with you some of the, the wonderful work that's been done by other libraries in Greater China and some of the work that's been done at my university. And these just happen to be places that I have been to or am aware of. And I know there are many other examples. For example, in Singapore, uh, there, are, there are lots of, of great examples. But I just wanted to, to share very different types of libraries so you can see some of the issues around green design. So the first, the first library I want to talk about is the Foshan Library in China, and it's the IFLA Green Library 2018 award winner. Uh, Foshan is the third largest industrial city in Guangdong province, big manufacturing base, but it's also been designated a national forest city um, and actually a sponge city. It's by a river, and it. it there is a lot of green development there. The library was designed by Arab and HLA, which is a, a, a Danish company, and it meets China's two-star green standard. Um, it's, you can get three stars in China for green buildings. This, this got two. Um, and these are, these are the six indicators that actually uh, cover the Chinese standards. And one of the things I would say is, really make sure that you know what your standards are in your country. Who, who has built 
to the highest level of green standards in their country? Anybody? No, okay, you really need to know. They, yeah, <laughs> you need to know what those standards are and, and really try and, and, and build to them. So, this is the library. Um, and what you, you can see, um, the facade actually reflects paper cutting, which is a traditional craft within um, Foshan, but it also provides shade, um, and in a very hot environment, shade is really important. It has seven roof gardens. It, it has a very large floor print, um, and that, that's Chinese libraries are being built to, to a very large scale. There are now, I think, over eight libraries in China that, over, that are over 100,000 square meters. They're very big libraries. This library um, was built, oh, was built um, to this standard. I think it won the award, not simply for the design. It actually uses a lot of features. Um, so, for example, it reuses rainwater, etc. But actually, the activities that go on in the library that support raising awareness of green issues um, are really part of why it won the library award. And you can see with the open spaces, some flexibility in the furniture. They run a lot of events. Um, they even run gardening courses within the library. Um, they, let me just find the, the details. They actually did some monitoring of their um, energy use. Does everybody monitor their energy use in the library? Yeah? Good. Some, <laughs> they actually, um, in 2017, they extended their space in their opening hours, and they had a 36% increase in visits, but only an 11% increase in electricity and a 7% increase in water consumption. So you can see that active monitoring of uh, energy usage has been really important to them. So this is a, to me this is a classic example of the type of library that's being built in China nowadays, but it is a very, very good example of a green library in a rapidly developing um, area. The next library I want to talk about is um, the Beitou Public Library in Taipei, which was the first green library building in Taiwan, and it was opened in 2006. Um, it's in the middle of a, a park um, that's known for its hot springs. And it was really, if you look at the scale, it's a very different scale to the, the Foshan Library. It's nestled in the park, and it's been designed to extend the park into the library. So when you have a look at it, um, you can see on the roof, you've got the green roof for insulation, you've got the solar panels, they collect rainwater, verandas all the way around for shading, but full length windows to also let light in. And the construction material is, is mainly wood. And if you look in, inside, you can see that they have really tried to bring the outside into the library. Um, all the shelves are in wood, they use, they use environmentally friendly paint, and you can't really see, but the big towers uh, are around the passive ventilation system. So this is a, a wonderful example of a, a green library that actually has inspired many other green library developments in Taiwan. So the next library I want to talk about very briefly is the Tama Art University Library in Japan, just outside Tokyo. And I want to really just show you this because it's the architect, Toyo Ito, is a world-class architect, um, and it's just a beautiful building, but it's also a, a green building, and it was all about trying to 
fuse nature and technology. So if you look at the building, it actually has 166 arches. None of them are the same. If you think about a tree or nature, you don't get a tree with, you know, 100 branches that are exactly the same. So this building actually reflects uh, the way Nate, it's, it's an organic building, and it actually follows the slope of the land, and I'll show you that um, in a minute. And because it's a, an art library, there's a lot of open space for exhibitions, for evaluation sessions, etc. So this um, is, you can see the slope down. It literally follows the slope of the land. Uh, they haven't engineered it at all in, well, minimal engineering to, uh, to, to make a, a flat space. And they've actually been incredibly innovative. So you can see um, the top right hand, the stools are actually have got curved furniture to deal with the slope of the library itself. Um, and again, you can see the, the different arches that bring in natural light, minimize the need for artificial lighting. And um, the gray carpet in the middle, you can see again, passive ventilation is, is very important. So to me, this is a very, it's an incredibly beautiful library. Um, if, if you walk in, it's quite awe-inspiring, but it's, it's, it's to a human scale. Um, the indoor environmental quality is, is wonderful. So if you have a chance, please go and visit this library, and in fact, any library by Toyo Ito. It's it, the amazing architect. I want to talk a bit about our library now. Um, and actually, Pang architects, who were the interior designers, have been influenced um, and, and have had mentorship from Toyo Ito. So this is really about an extension to a 1960s library that opened in 2013. And there are many, um, many issues about building in Hong Kong. If you're building in a, in a city that's constantly a building site, I think my, my colleague Leo over there will, will um, agree. I mean, Hong Kong, everything just gets knocked down and rebuilt. And so the, in terms of sustainability, the preservation of a kind of history and culture was a real issue for uh, the change and the extension of a library. And even a 1960s library was viewed by our community as a, a very precious historic building. And also um, for the university, they, they had developed a, um, a new strategy for a sustainable green campus. And it was really important that this building was really the flagship for green development on campus. So, um, the, the white building is, is the classic 1960s library design. Uh, looks a bit like a fortress, let's keep the light out, let's protect the books. Um, and then next to it is the extension. And we sit in front of a wonderful, beautiful um, square, a courtyard, um, and one of the big issues that we had was to completely preserve that while developing the library. So that courtyard space could not be changed in terms of its layout. And we ended up, we couldn't build at all. We actually ended up going underneath. And actually in Hong Kong, going underneath is a real solution to many of the issues in terms of land use. So this is where we went underneath. You can see uh, the diagram beneath. We have the beacon, the statue, and we went completely underneath in a U-shaped basement. Um, at the top, these are the stones that were uh, marked taken away and put back in exactly the same place. 
Um, you can see in the center at the top, that's the external part of the library, now an integral part of the internal extension, but it was left as it was. Um, and you can see, obviously, the connection between the old and the new building. And one of the issues, if you're talking about sustainability, is habitat and animals and birds. And in fact, Chinese University um, has the largest colony of house swifts in Hong Kong. And with the build, this... You can see the far corner. This is where the extension is built. And we had to move those swifts and their nests round to the other side of the building in order to preserve the colony. And we worked very closely with our academic colleagues who came up with artificial nests to encourage um, the, the house swifts to move. We tested different types of glass so that the, the, the birds would fly into, into, the, um, into the glass. So there was a lot of thought that went into how do actually preserve the habitat and the, the wildlife around us. And again, that's something that, that you, may, you may face. But I want to talk a bit about the kind of passive design that went into, into this. So um, we tried to actually make the new library as open as possible. If you think about the old library, you had kind of window slits. You could really not sit close to a window and close to light. So we really tried to design it so that there was as much light coming in as possible, but it's also north facing, so it's important for us to, to shade. And you can see um, the glass underneath, there's, it's jutting out, there's almost like a veranda, so there's shading as people can walk around the library. It's really important in Hong Kong. Um, here is a diagram of the skylight, just coming with, the, with the, the light coming into the library. And the bottom um, diagram, I don't know if you can see very well, but going up the middle, there is a kind of walkway that walk, that, so you can actually gradually walk through the library. And if you've ever been to Hong Kong, almost every building is dependent on lifts. So being able to walk through the library was really a, um, quite, quite a, an important green uh, uh, issue for us. And this is actually underneath the, um, the pond that you saw in the courtyard. So what, our, what Pang Architects really tried to do was bring, even in a basement, bring as much natural light into the space as possible. Um, and it's worked beautifully. You get amazing reflections from the pond. Um, and you do feel that you're, you're part of the, the natural environment, you're not in a basement. So we also tried to make as much use as we could of green technology. This is something that my um, campus development office put together, showing the different types of technology they use. Some are very simple, you know, solar landscape lighting, um, LED task lighting, that was new for us. Um, Fresh air is controlled by means of CO2 sensors, uh, using energy management, a district cooling system, and a heat pump for um, not just heating, but in, in Hong Kong and in, in, in the, the south, dehumidification is, is essential. Um, and then a roof garden, and I'm gonna talk a bit about the roof garden, because you can see it's just a kind of green grass and it was a great idea let's have a roof garden um, it went brown and was completely underused so what we actually managed to do was get some funding to turn it into a rooftop garden not just a, not just grass and we now have 40 members of library staff who um, work together uh, growing vegetables, growing organic vegetables on this rooftop garden. And to me, this is a really 
you know, a great example of hearts, winning hearts and minds. This isn't just a green library. It's not simply about design. It's also about changing attitude. And it all comes back to awareness and attitude. So we did a, um, a, a survey of our, our, our gardeners, and they say that, um, you know, it, participating in the rooftop garden raises awareness of the importance of a green life. In Hong Kong, most people do not have a garden. Say 90% of people don't have a garden. So that link with, with, with the earth uh, is, is, has to be nurtured as best you can. Um, so that's, to me, turning even what was a, which was a good idea, was a, a roof, a green roof, into something beyond a green roof, into something that really helps change attitudes is, is very important. So I want to talk just very briefly about the future, because I think the, the challenges that we face around sustainability and green design are really urgent. Um, and I, I attended an IFLA meeting in Berlin that I think Klaus was at, um, and there was a lot of talk about actually degrowth, to actually tackle these issues. We shouldn't be talking about growth and building, you know, big libraries, etc. We should be talking about degrowth. Now, I know this is a really challenging concept that you may not agree with, but I think it's something we need to at least start thinking about. What does degrowth mean? for us as librarians. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of projects that our School of Architecture have been working on. Um, and I, I'm very optimistic about this because this is our School of Architecture students working on this project and really thinking through some of the issues. So the first um, project is called a book house. These aren't traditional libraries. Uh, these are, this is a, a, a community library, and it's in Hunan province, uh, fairly central China. It's an ethnic minor, minority village that they've been working in. And if you know anything about villages in China, one of the real challenges they face is degrowth. They call it the hollowing out of villages, so that the, uh, most of the working adults have uh, left as migrant workers, and left behind are the children and the grandparents. And this is a real, a real issue. So it, it is how do, you, how do you cope with that degrowth? So this is the village. And in the center, you can see the book house that has been designed by um, our, our School of Architecture. And they followed a very, again, part of sustainability is how do you sustain your culture? Um, and that, so they followed a very um, traditional Dong minority design of, of buildings on stilts um, with a central staircase, very much a community space. And it's a, a space that has windows, but actually has no doors at all. So there's no heating, um, so it's a very open space. But it is a wonderful space for the children. You can see this is winter. They're all wearing their coats in the space, but they are still enjoying using the space, borrowing books. So this is, um, again, you can see the wood, sustainable local materials used to build. The next project I want to talk about is very different, and it's in Hong Kong. And um, it's in one of the uh, housing estates in Hong Kong. Here you can see uh, in the picture, I think there are 90, 90 or 99 towers uh, that make up this housing estate. And it's um, a private housing estate. It's probably one of the largest private run housing estates in the world. Uh, it's at Meifu and it has a... Uh, you can probably see from the plan, it has a, a large uh, 
roadway running right through it. It's incredibly dense. Um, I think, let me just check the details. Yeah, there's about 80,000 people living in this area. Um, so it's a very large, dense, urban development. And this, in many ways, uh, typifies Hong Kong. There, and, and Hong Kong doesn't have a lot of space to develop. So it's really got to think, how do, we can't grow. Um, how do we actually utilize the space that we have? And this is a challenge that was put to our, our uh, architecture students. And they came up with the book tree. Okay? It's not... But it's a book tree. It's mobile. It's easily built, easily deconstructed. And they've placed it under a space that's really not heavily used. It's under the bypass under the road. And here you can see people making use of it. And these are some of the comments. And I think this is interesting for us as librarians in Hong Kong. So, um, you know, kids have a lot of questions to ask while reading books. And I always felt that I was disturbing other children who were doing their homework in the libraries. But here I can let her run around and not have to worry about noise because it's a public space. Or, you know, here he's a lot more engaged. He takes out the books. He's interested. He doesn't want to leave. Now, I'm delighted to say that our public library is actually talking with the School of Architecture to see how they can take this project and, and use it in, in their, their work within Hong Kong. But to me, um, I want to end on an op so, you know, an optimistic note. This is great architecture. It's sustainable. Um, it's urban. Um, it deals to some extent with the issue we have with growth. Um, and I'm just really happy that our architecture students and our librarians are beginning to, to work through this issue. So um, I have lots of references. Uh, and I'm sure they'll share the presentation, but thank you. So um, we'll take just a minute if there are a couple, if anybody has questions or. Uh... Oh, okay. Now I got it, thank you. The size of the book tree, if it serves the whole uh, population of the towers. Uh, you can see from this picture, it's not very large and actually the number of books are not large. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it serves the whole population, but it's simply a, a place where people can go and borrow and use books. And I think they've designed it I know that it, with this, it was in Meifu, it's now uh, been used in another um, kind of uh, district called Sham Shui Po. And I think having that mobile space, it's small, it's like a pop-up space really. It, it can't serve the whole population. It's really about taking, actually use, it. it's about taking the library out, but it's also thinking about, we can't, be, in Hong Kong, we don't have, a huge amount of space, unless we reclaim from the sea, you know, where are we going to put our new libraries? What type of library service, what kind of sustainable library service do we need? Um, and this is just an example uh, to deal with, with Hong Kong's really dense urban space. And underneath 
you know, some people have said, but this isn't a very good space because the, the air quality is poor, and that's probably true. But it's just a, it's an experiment to see how we, we use those spaces that are underutilized. And, and you may find around your, your town or your campus that there, there are spaces where people go, but they're not really utilized. Uh, think about how, how you can use them. Now, the other thing is, this is in a basement. I like the light, so I don't know if uh, peep, what's above the book tree? Is it sidewalks or what is it? What is above is a road. Road, okay. It's that, you see the red dot? That's actually where the book tree was placed. It's actually underneath a roadway because space is at such a premium in Hong Kong, they wanted to see if, instead of trying to build new buildings, can they actually utilize space that hasn't been thought of as, as, as a potential for libraries? Um, I said there are lots of issues with this, but I think it's a, a very interesting experiment um, and a, a, new, a different way of starting to think about, about libraries and space and the built environment when you haven't got much space. <laughs> Yesterday and today, we've been rethinking notions of the library and of user experiences and making those more relevant. Now, we've been saying and hearing things like this for many, many years, and yet we looked at photographs this morning of buildings from the 90s that reflected none of that. In this room, where a converted audience why have we been so slow to adapt? And how can we, through IFLER and other groups, make more of a difference? I mean, why we, why we have been so slow to adapt is, I think, an issue for the whole world. I mean, what, why have we not responded to what was very clearly a climate emergency? And actually, we're still not really responding uh, rapidly enough. And it's to do with, with money, with politics, with our comfort. You know, I think there's lots of issues about why. But I think um, I agree that IFLA um, and actually the library associations in your countries can really take this on. And I think with the IFLA and the SDG work, that's a very good link to all of this. And I really would say, you know, Enstalib is, is, is a fantastic resource for people. Um, but your local, your global library associations, I think also have a, a big role to play in this. Um, and actually your individual libraries, you know, it's us, particularly as library directors, you know, when we're talking about renovation, when we're talking about building. If you go back to... Um, I can't go back. Uh -huh. If you go back to the, the, the green checklist... The first thing it says is, you know, Set your sustainability goals. Set your definition of green. And I think it's, it's just incumbent upon us to make sure that happens. Um, and it may be difficult, and there may be discussions and arguments because there are costs, but we have a... You know, I, I strongly believe that we, as librarians and as architects, have a leadership role in this. Um, it can't, we can't ignore this anymore. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, leave us off there and I'm going to thank you very much to Louise. And I'm gonna 
that uh, now introduce our next speaker, uh, Klaus Werner, who is the director of the library and head of the Philological Library at the Free Unistat Universitat Berlin. I've totally mispronounced that, and I apologize. Um, he, is, <clears throat> he has published several books on library buildings and library buildings and equipment, uh, and he consults internationally on library buildings and change management, so I'm also very, look, very much looking forward to his perspective. Oh, and the inevitable. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. So, um, form follows function. You may say, what a cliche is this? The postulation, the term form follows function, goes back to Chicago architect Louis Sullivan, Ch Chicago school architect Louis Sullivan. You all know Louis Sullivan, the father of the skyscrapers from the late 19th century, a wonderful architect. And, but in 1896, when he uh, said form follows function, and he wrote an essay about this, he meant a little bit something different than we do nowadays. And he said, where function does not change, Form does not change. Today, we all know that the functions of library buildings of the 21st century has changed a lot. But the challenge still is how to get the appropriate form, how to get the appropriate design. And we have to consider there are probably numerous forms of each single function of a library. Let me focus today in this lightning talk, a very sh a short lightning talk, let me focus today on ecological sustainability and form follows function. Um, and uh, I think the sustainability is a very strong driving force behind the evolving concept of libraries. And let me explain form follows function with an outstanding example of how the library design can follow functional requirements. So, and we, our library in Berlin, we started early. So, Louise said uh, about something about this when, when it began the first green library in Taipei. So, we are not a green library, not a perfect green library, but it's interesting to compare the the aspects of sustainability with form follows function. And we started with a concept in the late 1990s. We opened in 2005, so this is not the library of the 21st century. It's not brand new. And some facts and figures, how big it is. So the site was 55 to 65 square meters. We have 6,200 square meters inside the building. We have five levels. We, have, we, are, we were book-oriented because the concept was from the 1990s. We have 800,000 books on open shelves. We have 680 user seats. We opened every day during the week. Uh, and the question was, uh, Louise meant, oh, it's, it's expensive to, maybe it's expensive to build um, a green library. So we compared it with other European new built academic libraries. And we, although we have a very famous architect, we were 
under the average of a new built academic library. So 20 million, it was 20 million euro. So you can compare the square meters and then you, you will get it. So my university, the Free University of Berlin, 20 years ago invited Lord Norman Foster, the god, one of the gods, but I like Tojo Ito too, this is a wonderful architect in, in Japan. Um, we invited Foster to design a library for the Department of Humanities. And the framework for the university was sustainability, because we want to be a green, something like a green university. When the architect asked the university, who are the library users? Very good questions for, for a, from a good architect. Who are the library users? What are they doing there? Who, how long do they stay inside the building when they are coming? And where should it be located? His conclusion after many discussions was to focus on the library user, not on the administration. So we have no administration within the building. To give as much daylight as possible to the users because the natural light is the most important resource for reading and writing, for studying in an academic library. A comfortable climate by low energy costs. And this is important. This building works in Europe, in Central Europe, but it couldn't work in Hong Kong. So this is perfect architecture, depends on the location. So, and he wants an inspiring atmosphere and the right location, the best site, because he was not satisfied with our site we wanted to build on, and this was a parking lot, and he changed the site. Considering all these functions, the architect developed not a boring rectangular box with a five-star green certificate, but a building with a smart relationship between the university's green requirements and a user-focused functional library design. This is from outside, and you see the, the flaps of the natural ventilation system. No air condition. The design follows these functions, and these are the main criteria. An oval bubble shape, an organic bubble shape, which brings daylight from everywhere into the building, from each side. So there are no sides. This is uh, an oval thing. Um, and you, you see it with the, with the daylight. An overall facade, it's kind of like an overall facade as a double-layered skin to protect us against the sun and the cold. And it's double-layered because we are filtering the light. You cannot look outside directly. So we, we protect against the direct sunlight. So we have no glare uh, within, within the building. He shrinked the volume with this form, with this shape. The architect shrinked the volume to get structural economy of space. This was the idea, yeah? to cut the edges of a box and to, to minimize the volume. A natural ventilation system, I already mentioned it, for a one-room library. It's just one room. The whole space is one room over these 6,200 square meters with some acoustic problems. So, but it's just one room. Uh, a separation of library administration, I already mentioned. That means we have no offices inside the library. It's totally focused on the user and what he what, what they uh, do um, in the library. And the site, the location. The library is an, a project of integration. We brought together 13 different academic libraries in this big branch library. This is just the branch library. This is not the main library of the university. It's just the branch. 
And before we had 13 smaller and bigger libraries of our Department of Humanities and we, we brought them together and it's integration. And the architect said integration means not only integration of these collections but integration into the campus building just in the middle of the existing campus building from the 1970s. So he asked for changing the site from a parking lot beside and integrated the building into the campus building of, of the department. This is also a concept for saving energy. This is the, the process of planning from the competition on the left to the final concept on the right. So he began with a box. Yeah, you see, he began with a box. He won the competition with a box. <laughs> and then he developed it and developed it. Yes, that's possible. That's possible. Uh, he developed it asking and, and making his conclusions and so on and so on. Form follows function. He was thinking about the functions and the form he, the shape he developed. So the characteristic shape of, the, of this library building is a consequence of form follows function. And this is the smart relationship. Although it is a new interpretation of the reading room, from the iconographic point of view, it refers to the cupola and the rotunda in history of libraries. The iconic reading rooms we all know since, since Boulet in the 18th century. This is a, a line of tradition. And this is the contradiction to the floating spaces in libraries since the 1930s of Avaralto and, and all these followers. Um, and I'm sure you would agree that library space as kind of floating landscape describes exactly what we all have in mind now when we are thinking about a library for today and for the future. This is not the library of the future. But it, it works well, it works well, and it's a fascinating combination of tradition and asking, uh, answering our questions, how can we get um, a little bit like a green library with less energy consumption and so on. So we have natural ventilation system run by a computer and the heat we get from a concrete activation floor. Yeah? This is the combination of these two aspects. In our case, the nickname, the Berlin Brain, the Berlin Brain, at least seems to be a very strong metaphor for a library building and the special features of the tradition functionality of a reading room is still one must have for academic users. It's one aspect of different aspects. This is just one for us, but the reading room is still alive. Lessons learned in the dynamic field of changing concepts of libraries for today and tomorrow, flexibility, or better with McDonald's, adaptability as a functional demand for library space is often contradictory to other functions. We have to face this. Among them also is ecological sustainability. That means in general, the formula form follows function may fail if the relationship between space and function is both too complex and too contradictory. But last but not least, there, are some, there is one thing we learned as well, the wow effect. You all remember the wow effect, the 11th criteria from McDonald. The wow effect, the very new criteria of good library space McDonald introduced about 15 years ago, is not an add-on. It could be a real function. It's not a criteria. It could be a function of a library building. You cannot overestimate it. Thank you.
This was, this was just right, a special event. This is not the uh, normal uh, illumination during the night. <laughs> this is once a year when we have a, a special night, so. <laughs> Hi, Klaus. I needed to not make a question, but just a couple of considerations about this beautiful building. The first point is that since I'm an architect, this is one of the not uh, frequent occasions to be very proud about our work. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> literally, you presented this in a great way. And uh, the second point was about uh, pure aesthetics, which I think is a very important tool. And it has to do with the uh, uh, ability of uh, um, receive the attention, uh, in particular for the libraries, uh, from the common people around. So the aesthetics in this building, uh, I experienced this uh, when I entered the, in the place, and, and I saw the pattern of the of the light, uh, uh, which con constantly moves uh, because it's made of these two layers. Uh, so this kind of aesthetics created by natural um, materials, let's say the light, uh, and not by decorations or colors or something else, uh, is just something really beautiful that has this ability of attract the attention of the people and somehow a sort of a, creates a sort of sacred place uh, for studies. This, is my, this was my great impression when I was there. So this was, I wanted to just give this opinion. Yes, thank you, Fabio. I just want to, for all of you to know, I visited, I come from Mexico, as you know, and I visited the library about four or five years ago, and I was marveled. In regards to the lightning, as you enter, you forget about lightning. It's so perfect. You know, and I spent a couple of hours there, and you know, as you enter other buildings, you say, there's not enough light, please put the light on. Oh, it's too much, much light, the sun is hitting. So this is, I'm amazed of the architect that he really thought of the patron, of the user. You must be the happiest librarian <laughs> of all of us. Thank you, Helen, but to be honest, we were leaking for many, many years. <laughs> And I was so unhappy with this, not with the building, but with this leaking. The, the rainproofness was a big problem, but it was not caused by the, the architecture. It was a mistake uh, during the construction. As everywhere, it's a mistake during the construction. But it, I was so unhappy because this was terrible for, for our image, <laughs> the, the dropping from above, from above, you know. You mentioned that, uh, in your view, it's not the library of the future. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, on what functions cannot fully be addressed in the building that you think are important nowadays or for the future? Um, the architect asked the university many, many questions in the late 1990s. So, and he asked, what are they doing, the students? And in the late 1990s, Every student of our department has to write an essay several times a year. And work. He, he, all, all the students are, were working alone, not in groups. And they need many, many printed books in the late 1990s. So this building is focused on working alone, working 
concentrate on what you are doing on the table with books or with digital resources. Okay, um, we have Wi-Fi for sure, but this is not uh, this is not a, a the functionality is just one one way of of working of studying. So and we we tried during the last years to add. We have a tunnel to the to the part of the existing buildings where our offices are. We have a tunnel into the library, and behind the tunnel, we developed some group study rooms. So this, be, but it's not the mistake of the architect. The the department, the faculty said we need a perfect place to read, to write, many books on open shelves. So this is the old-fashioned thing of this concept. But we have now we have in the university some other branch libraries, very, very modern, very, very up-to-date, and the students can choose to go there if they need a, a very well-designed uh, classroom or a group study room or something else. Klaus, this is, I'm right, I'm right here. I, I have a question around the signage. One of the, I'm right here. Yeah. So um, I have also been to this building and do love it, but you are absolutely right. I agree with you about the 21st century uh, and the singularity of the, of the work there. But one of the things that did strike me when I was in that building was the signage. And I thought the signage mm -hmm. was actually pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, not only the visual um, images that were there, but the way you were directed around that building. Mm -hmm was instantly clear as you came into the building and I'm, you didn't talk about that at all and I was just curious about it. Yeah, because it's not about sustainability. So then and I, I uh, kept it. So the signage, it, we, we, this is um, bilingual. It's German and English. Um, we are not happy with this signage system because it's a, it's a dark red and the main color of the building you all saw these melon yellow, but the main color is gray. And, and it's a, a really, a, not a dark gray, but it's, it's gray, it's a mouse gray, yes? <laughs> so, and dark red on gray, this is a problem. Um, and think about red-green blind people, not people, these are men. All these red-green, you know, this, these are men. And they, they have many, many problems. And uh, the designer of the, the signage system, uh, she did several airports. And we were thought, oh, what, what is this? How could it work? Yeah? So this is, this is a problem. Uh, these, there's not enough contrast between the dark red and the gray of the building. And the architect had chosen the gray as main color, white, gray, and two kinds of gray, because he said, we don't want to bother the users with anything. The users should concentrate on their work, and they are colorful, and the books are colorful. And she just implemented the melon yellow, and the melon yellow is a little bit, you, you all can see the melon yellow in the international airport of Beijing which is a foster design too. It's the same color. And he implemented it because this is a little bit retro from the existing building from the 70s around it. And there you can find this melon yellow. And he put it into it. But the signage system, we also have a, a digital a wayfinding system um, in, in the library. And many, many of the users, they take the, the, the digital with his yeah, with, with a, with a um, smartphone, and and they find the books with this wayfinding system. Okay, one one last question. Thanks very much, Klaus. Um, your title, form follows function, and of course we all have lots of examples of particularly architects who follow the form rather than the function you know, Zaha, Hadid, et cetera, of building buildings that don't work. But, you know, this really does seem to work for you. But I thought it was really interesting that you sort of finished with that wow factor uh, because 
you know, we heard examples in, in, in other countries where the library has a bad name or that you have to sort of bring people back to the library. And I was just wondering if you had any comments further on that about your project and what it did for your relationship with the university and with the students, perhaps. So, the, an iconic project is a gift. Huh? Uh, it's a gift, but it's a challenge too. So, it's a gift because you can develop it as a, as a not a very important librarian in a big university, but you can develop it for branding for the whole university. And, and this library, for a long time, for many years, this was the, the iconic image of the university. So, and we tried to get into the main, um, into television, yes? And, and for a couple of years, when on television, during the news, there was something about science, an academic world, there was the library behind. So, and this, yes, we succeeded, yes? So, this, this is a challenge, and, and to maintain it. If you have this gift, you have to maintain it and to, yeah, to change a little bit, to, to follow the new requirements a little bit, one add-on or another one, but you have to maintain it, to keep the piece of artwork, not as an artwork, but as a function for the whole university. So, um, thank you very much, Klaus. Please join me. Thank you. And I know you're all going to hate me because I'm the one who keeps preventing you from getting to lunch and keeps pushing lunch back and back and back. But while we were on our way to lunch, before we, before we go all the way down the stairs, I'd like you all to just pause on the stairway on the way out, and we're going to take a group photo. So, um, so please gather your things for lunch, and then we'll, we'll all meet up on the stairs, we'll take the photo, and then we'll go on to lunch from there. Thanks, everybody.